You're listening to The David Knight Show. Not so far from here, there's a very lively atmosphere. Everybody's going there this year. And there's a reason The season opened last July Ever since the USA went dry Everybody's going there Going dry I'm going to I'm on my way to Cuba Oh yeah, that's, that's how I'm Cuba going. got the reputation that it had Under Batista Cuba it started with prohibition. Oh, you know, ever since the U.S. went dry, that's where people would go to party. That's why the mob moved in, if you remember the Godfather and so forth. They moved the uh, casinos down there. That's Irving Berlin. Uh, basically a current events song, <laughs> sung by uh, Bing Crosby. Yeah, they're going to go to CUBA, and that's really where Bernie uh, uh, keeps going back to. And no matter how many times people call him on that, uh, go ahead and take it down. He, he keeps saying it's unfair. It's unfair to say that everything is bad. He educated their kids. He gave them health care. He totally transformed the society with education and health care. So we're gonna, we talked about education in the last hour. We'll talk a little bit about health care. But we're really going to talk about Fidel. We'll call this segment Fidel, Five Fo Fum, I Smell the Lies of a Marxist Bum. Bernie Sanders, that bum who basically didn't have a job until he started writing uh rape fantasy fiction and then became a politician. <laughs> uh, they probably realized that he was their kind of guy. If you can write rape fantasy, uh, that's the kind of guy they're looking for. You know, they might even be able to get him to write some dossiers for the CIA to come after President Trump. Who knows? Uh, Bernie Sanders again refuses to back down in a CNN town hall in Charleston. Uh, Joe Biden's campaign has said that Sanders seems to have found more inspiration in the Soviets, the Sandinistas, the Chavistas, and Castro than he finds in America. And that's absolutely true. He can't find anything he likes about America. But boy, does he love the Sandinistas and the uh, Soviets you know, partying in Moscow. And uh, he loves Fidel Castro. And so Sanders replied, and he says, well, when dictators, ships, uh, whether it's the Chinese or the Cubans, they do something good, you acknowledge that. But he was the one who criticized President Trump when President Trump said nice things about Little Rocket Man. You know, when you're trying to negotiate with him about nuclear weapons, you're going to be diplomatic. And it's uh, very rare that President Trump is diplomatic. <laughs> it's usually brutally mocking. But when he says something diplomatic, they don't give him credit for that. They say he's a friend of the dictator. Well, you know, this guy is alive and he's trying, they're trying to stop him from building nuclear weapons. Uh, but why is Bernie still praising a dead dictator and keep doubling down on it? No matter what people say, no matter even when his own friends in the Democrat Party are saying, hey, this is making you look really bad, Bernie. It's making us look really bad. You're going to take us down with you. He keeps doing it. So why would he be uh, so faithful? to Fidel, a dead dictator. And why is he so faithful to a dead ideology, a dead economic system, communism? And he is a communist. And I've got a great clip here of Fidel Castro in 1965, six years after he took power, doing an interview in the U.S. And he doesn't want to call himself a communist either. He's just like Bernie. He's a Democrat. And he's all for democracy. He's all for the people, you know. Uh, he went on to add that after Castro took power in 1959, the first thing he did was to initiate a literacy program. Well, that's an absolute lie. Uh, that's another one of the lies of a Marxist bump. Let's go back and take a look at the history of Fidel Castro in Cuba. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, the Batista regime was known for its corruption, and it was corrupted largely because of, wait for it, prohibition. You know, kind of like we've had the war on drugs create all these drug cartels created one of the, actually it's now the most violent uh, war anywhere in the world. More people are dying now in, Q in uh, Cuba, in Mexico than in Syria. Syria only edged them out when they were having massive bombing campaigns. Now that those massive bombing campaigns have stopped. The violence in Mexico because of the U.S. war on drugs, and it's not the U.S. war on drugs, it's the U.N. war on drugs. It's a U.N. agenda that we're pushing. 
that's created that kind of corruption and profit that you find only in the black market. And so the corruption that we see in Cuba, the fact that the mob moved down there, because why? Because alcohol had been prohibited in the U.S. And people could go down there and, and uh, drink without having to worry about getting arrested. And they could also then, while they were there, they could engage in gambling and prostitution and other things like that. So it became a major crime. That always happens with prohibition. It always happens. It's the, uh, I, would, I would say it's the unintended consequences, but they've done this so many times. It might have been unintended when they did it with alcohol. But uh, after that happened, I don't think it's unintended anymore. I think it is an intended consequence of all of this. But in December of 1956, Castro and uh, a bunch of people that call themselves the 26th of July movement, those rebels landed on Cuban soil with the intention of starting a revolution. They were met by uh, heavy government forces of the Batista government, and nearly everyone in the movement was killed. Only a handful escaped, including Castro, Fidel Castro, his brother Raul, and Che Guevara, that icon of the leftist T-shirts. For the next two years, Castro continued guerrilla attacks and succeeded in gaining large numbers of volunteers. And so using guerrilla warfare tactics, he was able to take one town after the other. And then Batista lost popular support and suffered numerous defeats. And on January the 1st, 1959, Batista fled Cuba. Uh, during 1959 and 1960, Castro made radical changes to Cuba. That must have been the time when he instituted all of the revolutionary literacy programs and health care programs, right? Uh, no, no, that didn't happen. Now, what were his radical changes to Cuba? Well, he nationalized industry. He collectivized agriculture. And he seized American-owned private property, businesses, and farms. That's what communists do. And quite frankly, that's the plan of Bernie, too. So he's going to talk to you about education and health care. And they already had education and health care at very high levels compared to the rest of Central and South America. I've got those uh, facts coming up here as well uh, from the Foundation for uh, Economic Education. They said, no, Fidel Castro did not improve health care or education in Cuba. And so I'll give you the statistics coming from UNESCO. Bernie is lying about that. But what he did do was he nationalized industry. He collectivized agriculture. And what is the big program of Bernie that he keeps talking about? I'm going to take over the power grid, nationalize it. I'm going to take it over. Take, uh, shut down all these uh, coal companies and uh, oil and gas. We're going to ban oil and gas. And we're going to, uh, I don't know what we're going to run the power, but I'm going to run the power grid out of Washington. Probably just sheer political power, the sheer will of this communist, Bernie Sanders will. Power all of your appliances and your electric car after he bans your other cars. Bans the fuel for them, as a matter of fact. Uh, but anyway, um, so he nationalized things and he stole property because he's a communist. That's what communists do. That's what Bernie wants to do. He wants to nationalize and steal property from you. And then, of course, they established strong ties with the Soviet Union. Not Russia. The Soviet Union. Uh, the place that was Bernie's heartthrob where he went on his honeymoon, sang songs with his shirt off. Okay, so that was 1959, 1960. Castro takes power. 1961, we have the Bay of Pigs. 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. 1963, we have JFK assassinated. And then in 1965, we have this interview with Fidel Castro. Let's play it. In the struggle between communism and democracy, whose side, where is your heart, and where well, is your feeling? Really, same than democracy. Democracy is my idea, real. But many people used to call democracy seeing things that are not democracy. Yeah. Democracy have... Don't call me a uh, communist. I'm a Democrat. Kind. Not I'm the a idea. democracy. Those who use... Some, some of those who use democracy war. I am not communism. I am not agree with communism. There is no oh, doubt for oh, me. This is where Bernie gets it. Democracy <laughs> and communism. <laughs> sure. Okay, hold on right there. We got to go to break. We'll play the rest of this clip when we come back. Uh, play that for you again. Yeah, it's kind of like what we saw with uh, Booty Gay parroting Obama, right? Well, you got 
Bernie saying the same thing as Fidel Castro. I'm not a communist. I'm a democratic uh, socialist here. Okay, we'll be right back. Welcome back. You know, Bernie and I come from very different worlds. Back in the early 1960s, I was watching Wagon Train with Clint Eastwood. He was watching Fidel Castro in Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, this article from the New York Times, when America loved Fidel Castro, it came out a year ago, January 24th, uh, 2019, a year and a month ago. And at that time, they were writing that article because, not because Bernie was running for president, but because it had been, it was the 60th anniversary of Fidel Castro taking power in 1959. And uh, one of the things that he did after he took power was he came to the U.S. As New York Times points out, Castro's victory came as a complete surprise, even to him. But many Americans, even the CIA, had been rooting for Castro. That's right, he was our man, wasn't he? The CIA wanted him in there. That's probably one of the reasons why Batista took a uh, powder and a jet, and a, not, not a jet plane, a prop plane out of there at the time, right? CIA had turned. I mean, you know, you look at Manuel Noriega, Panama. Uh, he was Bush's guy until he turned on Bush, and then uh, Bush called him a strong man. No, he's a CIA puppet was what he was. He became corrupt, uh, corrupted by the war on drugs. Uh, but anyway, yeah, this is a guy that, the you know, Fidel Castro was put in by the CIA and with his assistance of the CIA, and uh, they liked him. They'd been rooting for him, as the New York Times points out. Castro spent a week traveling across Cuba in a caravan of victory. He was interviewed by Ed Sullivan, who called him his Barbudos, the bearded ones. And our real American tradition of George Washington, a really, really big shoe. And right here on our stage, we have Fidel Castro. Life magazine put Castro on the cover, called him the bearded rebel scholar. This is back in a time when beards were not a thing, right? <laughs> A dynamic boss and the liberator. The climax of Fidel mania, says the New York Times, came with Castro's visit to the U.S. in April. He spoke to a star-struck crowd of some 30,000 people in Central Park. A female admirer gushed, Fidel Castro is the best thing to happen to North American women since Rudolph Valentino. Now, 30,000 people, Central Park, and that was the pinnacle of Fidel Castro's American worship. You know who was there besides that? I bet. I bet you anything. I, I would love to be able to ask Bernie this question. Bernie, were you there in Central Park? Because, you know, Bernie was born in Brooklyn. And Bernie would have been 18, 19 at the most. I don't know what month he was born in. He would have been 18 or 19. He was born in 1941, so we're talking about 1959. He would have been 18, maybe 19, depending on birthdays. Uh, and, um, no, he would have been 18 and he went to Brooklyn college, you know, he eventually graduated in 1964 university of Chicago. That's where he got his bachelor's degree. So, uh, he was there, he was going to school at Brooklyn college as an 18 year old when Fidel, uh, entertained 30,000 rabid fans in central park. And I bet you anything, Bernie Sanders was out there and he probably had a thrill running up and down his leg, just like Chris Matthews when he sees Obama, right? <laughs> he can't get over that. He still loves the guy. Remember, 1959 and 1960. Uh, 1959, he becomes uh, president. He goes on victory tours for a while, and then he goes back to Cuba. Everybody loved him. And then after that big reception there, uh, the CIA puppet goes back to Cuba. He starts nationalizing everything. And he starts seizing American-owned property. Now the CIA doesn't like him anymore. Now they realize he's just another communist thief. And so they start working about how they can get rid of this guy. 1961, we have the Bay of Pigs. And then things get even worse with the Soviet uh, alliance and the missiles being brought in. So we have the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And then in 1963, we have the assassination of JFK. And again, I'm going to go back to then now. 1959, he takes power, he socializes and steals everything, right? Becomes a full-on communist. We have the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have the uh, well, Bay of Pigs, Cuban Missile Crisis, and JFK assassination, 1963. Now, 1965, after all this history, he's had Soviet missiles. He's nationalized everything for at least six years. 
He's been executing people, firing squads, putting them in prison and so forth. And he comes to America and he gets an interview with CBS in 1965, 1965. And the interviewer asks him, are you a communist? And let's play that clip again because I'm not a communist. I'm for democracy, right? I'm a democratic socialist. Here's Fidel Castro saying that just like Bernie, he is not a social, not a communist. Uh, video clip number two. In the struggle between communism and democracy, whose side, where is your heart and where well, is your feeling? Really, same than democracy. <laughs> democracy. Democracy is my <laughs> idea. Democracy. Really. But many people used to call democracy seeing things that are not democracy. Democracy don't has know the meanings of these uh, words. Let me explain the, what these words not mean. Not the idea. Those who use some some of those who use democracy were. I am not communism. I am not agree with communism. Not communism. There is no I doubt for me communism. between democracy and communism. Mr. But Mr. not Mr. only democracy as a word. That is why we call our ideals humanism. Because we not only want to give humanism. freedoms to the people, He's a but to give they He's not a communist a way or a socialist. of getting their life to eat, to live. Yeah, okay. You get the idea, right? Isn't that interesting that he doesn't, even Fidel Castro, I'm not a communist, I'm a democracy. I'm a democracy. Yeah, you're democracy if you vote for these people. Uh, he didn't get elected, by the way. He was put in by the CIA. But we're about to elect uh, somebody, the Democrats at least. It's pretty scary, isn't it? That Bernie keeps winning election after election? That tells you something very scary about our educational system and how that is a tool of communists and tyrants. Abroad. But no, no, no. I, he doesn't even want to use the word socialist. Why? Because at that point in time, everybody knew that socialism and communism are the same thing. They're just, it's just a beard. So he's cussed to come up with another word, right? Just like Hillary Clinton uses the word progressive. Well, he used the term, I'm a humanist, not a communist. I'm for humanism <laughs> and that uh, democracy. You keep using that word democracy. You do not know what that means. And you keep calling me a communist. You don't know what that means. And we know exactly what it means. He is the poster child for communism. And Bernie Sanders is the poster child for a lying communist in America. That's exactly what he is. Uh, no, he didn't improve health care. He didn't improve education. As a matter of fact... If you go back to 2016, the Washington Post did a fact check on this, and they looked at U.N. data from UNESCO. And according to UNESCO, Cuba had about the same literacy rate as Costa Rica and Chile in 1950. Both of them were close to 80 percent. Today, their literacy rates are about 100 percent. However, if you look at other countries like Peru, Brazil, El Salvador, Dominican Republic, they had much lower literacy rates, and they have caught up much quicker. Uh, they are at the same level as Cuba. And when you look at health care and you look at life expectancy, in 1959, before Castro's communists seized power, uh, they had a higher lifespan than anybody else in Latin America. Uh, you know, when we look at what's going on in Cuba, as I was uh, pointing out, the fact that um, they did not give the people health care. No, they had uh, better health care. As a matter of fact, the life expectancy of Cuba... Uh, was much higher and uh, when Castro took uh, charge of the uh, country and started confiscating everything, it was much higher than neighboring uh, countries. And now the neighboring countries have a couple of years in Latin America, Central Latin America in general. Uh, they have a life ex expectancy that's about the same or two years greater than Fidel Castro. Uh, so uh, they haven't kept up. As a matter of fact, they've lost a bit of ground in terms of health care. And then I think one of the most interesting things uh, is uh, we've had over the years many, many documentaries about the interesting automobile scene there in Cuba. Because, you know, when Castro took over in 1959, essentially, it froze. And if you want to see a country that uh, looks like the streets of America in the 1950s, well, you can go to Cuba. And it's kind of interesting that these people have been able to keep these cars running for you know, 50, 60 years <laughs> because 
the American cars of the 1950s, as you all know, were not generally designed to last that long. Uh, so this is a lot of loving care. Uh, loving care that uh, they give to these cars because they can't get anything else for the most part. And um, so these cars that were designed, uh, you know, to be kind of a planned obsolescence of cars in the 1950s, uh, they were designed to last three to five years. And they've been able to get them to go like 60 years. Kind of interesting. Uh, you know, you've got, uh, when, I, when I look at that, as uh, one article puts it, uh, any given parking lot or square in old Havana looks like a spilled Skittles bag full of brightly colored metal. <laughs> That's one of the things I've pointed out to my kids. I said, you know, you look at the cars today. Everything is either, uh, most cars are shade of gray, right? You got black cars, you got white cars, you got gray cars. And occasionally you'll have a red car or maybe a blue car, but that's about it for the most part. There are a few cars that are out there. Dodge has done some retro cars with some retro colors. But, I mean, you look at the streets of America today, they're pretty much just gray. And I said, you know, the 1950s was a time when morality and ethics was black and white, but the cars were in technicolor. And the cars are still in technicolor in Cuba. And if you understand what happened in, uh, in Cuba under Castro, the ethics, the morality, and the politics are going to be black and white, too. Uh, but I'm afraid that people really don't understand what's going on there. Uh, but they had other uses for the cars. Uh, they, these cars that they loved so much that they kept going for 60 years, uh, they used some of them. They turned them into boats to escape Cuba. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, this particular one here, the escape from Bernie Sanders' beloved socialist Cuba, as one person writes, uh, so how do you escape? Well, you take the cars, uh, even if you got to turn them into rafts. That's how you escape tyranny. You use cars. You get out of the cities. You go to the suburbs because you can't stand all the rules and fines of people like Mayor Bloomberg taking over New York City. So you get to the suburbs, Long Island or wherever, right? And they call that urban sprawl. They say that must be stopped. Say the urban planners, who are nothing other than Marxist central planners. And every one of the states, Texas included, you look at these people who are trained in colleges. They call them urban planners. They call them transportation. You took the Department of Transportation. They don't want you to have a car. They take out ads about it. You know, get out of your car. we got to stop the car. We don't want to build any infrastructure. We don't want to even repair the roads that our forefathers built. No, no, no. Uh, we want you out of those cars. And so they didn't get out of the cars. In, in fact, what they did was they took a truck, took a 50s Chevy truck. They turned it into a boat. Uh, what they did was they uh, strapped on a couple of 55-gallon oil drums. They used that to float the thing, uh, a few of those, uh, not just a couple. They used quite a few of them on all lining it on either side. And then they connected the truck's drive shaft to a propeller, and they were able to go about eight miles an hour, seven knots, about eight miles an hour. Uh, this was uh, the original one back in 2003. See, in 2003, Bernie, they were still trying to escape this paradise that Fidel had instantly created of education and free health care everywhere, right? So why are the people trying to escape it in 2003? Uh, unfortunately, they didn't escape it. Uh, they didn't, as, and there's an entire website called floatingcubans.com uh, showing pictures of various classic cars <laughs> that have been turned into boats. And, you know, I used to refer to my parents' classic cars, the 50s and 60s and the, you know, the big cars that they drove. I used to refer to them as boats. But these are quite literally boats. <laughs> I was just talking about the way they handled. But they turned these things into boats. Uh, as FloatingCubans.com says, this page is dedicated to the ingenuity and the entrepreneurial spirit of the various Cuban refugees who have attempted to sail to the United States on homemade vessels cleverly crafted from old American cars. Here's to you, floating Cubans. Your cleverness and your persistence inspire me. May you all achieve your goal and finally reach the land of McDonald's, Disney, and Coca-Cola. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, these we got pictures of these people because uh, they were intercepted uh, by the U.S. Coast Guard, which then sunk the car by using machine guns. <laughs> And uh, they called it, after this, uh, the uh, original floating car from Cuba. Uh, they called it, uh, uh, in uh, Cuban, they called it the word for truckanaut. 
And so they called all the people who were turning their uh, 50s cars as time was frozen by Fidel Castro in the 1950s. But think about this. I, I just want to put out for you that even though we see all the cars in Cuba, <laughs> and now since things have loosened up, they've been able to get some other cars in. But, I mean, you know, for decades and decades, this is 60 years ago, they had nothing but 1950s cars. And as I said, in the last couple of years, things have opened up a little bit for them. They've been able to get some other cars in. And um, yet Fidel Castro was not as radical and as anti-freedom as Bernie Sanders and AOC with their Green New Deal because they allowed the people to keep their 1950s cars. The gas guzzlers uh, that they had there. No, no, no. Bernie and AOC, they're going to take any of your internal combustion engines, uh, any, even the ones that are very, very clean. They're going to take them. Because why? Because they're communists. They're not environmentalists. They're communists. And that's what they do. Uh, Cubans escaping from uh, Cuba. Uh, there was actually a 60-second film that was put together by the U.S. Coast Guard showing uh, people escaping between 1994 and 2004. Uh, some of them, you know, prior to 2003, they weren't using... Uh, cars that they turned into boats. They would do anything they could, rafts, whatever. And as they point out, the pictures may seem unreal, but they are, in fact, very real, and they demonstrate the sheer desperation of what many Cubans have done in search of freedom and justice to get away from this Marxist utopia that Bernie is trying to sell us. I tell you what, if you'll buy his lies about Fidel Castro, you'll buy anything from this guy. Uh, except uh, the only thing he's selling is austerity. And when we come back, we're going to talk about his environmental plan. I'm just going to remind you, we covered it when it happened at the time, but back in September, remember he went to a uh, environmental, a, a climate town hall that was being put up by CNN. Climate change town hall. And he was asked by a woman, uh, human population growth is more than doubled in the past. Few what are you going to do to save the planet from humans? Well, he's got a plan to kill the babies, just like all the other Democrats do. We'll tell you about that when we come back. Stay with us. All right, yeah, we've been talking about Cuba, and I've got one more segment about Cuba, uh, because uh, maybe he could go there. Uh, maybe he could go to CUBA. I don't know. Uh, but let's talk about his ideas of how he's going to transform America. And going back to September... Uh, 2019, this last September, September 5th, we had a town hall on climate change produced by none other than CNN. And I'm going to play this for you because uh, the woman wants to know what we can do to control the population. And as I pointed out this last week, we've got a woman who is a professor in the UK. Uh, she wants to destroy the human race. She is in, uh, she wants to end the Anthropocene uh, Anthropocenes, which is human, uh, mankind, human, okay? She can't use those words, so she's got to come up with something else. Uh, newsflash, professor. Anthro means man in Greek, okay? So you're, <laughs> you're, you, can't, you, want to, you don't want to use the word mankind. You don't want to use human because it's got man in it. So you use a Greek word that has man in it to say, I want to get rid of all of mankind. And she thinks it's cool because she's a feminist. Uh, but she talks about being an antinatalist. And she says, let's go where these people are afraid to go. Let's just talk about the fact that we shouldn't have any kids. We just need to, you know, do a soft kill. I'm not talking about lining people up and committing genocide. No, no, no. I'm not talking about mass murder. Let's just stop having kids and we'll just die off. And we got to die off to save the planet. And so that's basically what this woman is saying. She said it's human population growth. What are we going to do to save the planet? Well, you know, we've had uh, Bill Gates point that out. He goes, you know, you've got these different things. Well, here's the equation, right? People produce pollution. Kind of hard to reduce the pollution if you got more and more people because, I mean, you know, they're breathing out carbon. Carbon. Uh, they mean carbon dioxide, which is what the plants need, but they just talk about carbon because carbon's dirty. And as we showed you last week, people like Chris Matthews don't know the difference between carbon monoxide coming out of the tailpipe that will, uh, you can kill you if you breathe it uh, for a long, prolonged period of time in an enclosed garage. He doesn't know the difference between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, uh, which is what he breathes out when he spews his lies. 
And so this lady has a, a question, and Bernie Sanders is willing to go there. Would you be courageous enough, she says, to address this issue and make it a key feature of your plan to address climate catastrophe? And he goes on and on about a woman's right to choose and everything. But look, folks, what he's talking about here is killing kids. And the bottom line is that we've got to give money to poor countries so they can kill the kids in poor countries. Uh, let's play that clip going back to September of 2019, video clip number one. Human population growth has more than doubled in the past 50 years. The planet cannot sustain this growth. I realize this is a poisonous topic for politicians, but it's crucial to face. Empowering women and educating everyone on the need to curb population growth seems a reasonable campaign to enact. Would you be courageous enough to discuss this issue and make it a key feature of a plan to address climate catastrophe? Well, well the answer is yes. <laughs> And the answer has everything to do with the fact that women in the United States of America, by the way, have a right to control their own bodies and make reproductive decisions. And the Mexico City Agreement, which denies American aid to those organizations around the world that, are, uh, that allow women to have abortions or even get involved uh, in birth control, to me is totally absurd. So I think, especially in poor countries around the world, uh, where women do not necessarily want to have large numbers of babies, and where they can have the opportunity through birth control to control the number of kids they have, something I very, very strongly uh, support. Yeah, so the solution to save the planet is to kill the kids. And we can give money to kill poor uh, kids in poor countries as well. Uh, but that's courageous, right? That's what the lady said. Are you courageous enough? to go there, to say that we have to kill kids to save the planet? Yes, I'm, I'm courageous enough to do that. Just like you saw Booty Gay, courageous enough to applaud the sexualization of a nine-year-old, the pedophilia that we saw on stage. Yeah, he was courageous enough to do that for his political campaign. So it's courageous to kill kids. It's courageous to sexualize them and throw them into the arms of pedophiles because that's what we're talking about here. Oh, you can determine when you're nine years old that you are gay, and you can determine when you are six years old, five years old, that you are gender dysphoric, and so you can determine that you want to change your gender. Therefore, there is no age of consent for these pedophiles who want to sodomize these kids. Let's just understand what we're talking about here. But we can kill them, and that's courageous. The answer is yes. Yes. And uh, he talks about the Mexico City Agreement. Uh, this, by the way, is an agreement that denies American aid. This is Bernie Sanders. The Mexico City Agreement, he said, denies American aid to those organizations around the world that allow women to have abortions. In other words, we're not going to pay for abortions uh, around the world. Planned Parenthood. We're not going to pay Planned Parenthood to enact their policy of genocide on black people in Africa like we've paid for them to enact their policies of genocide on black people in urban areas here in America. That was part of the Mexico City Agreement. It's an agreement, and it's actually law, except the Democrats don't pay any attention to that. And even though the Paris Climate Agreement was not agreed to by the Senate, they say, well, you know, we're going to enforce that as if it was law because it was self-ratified by Obama. He didn't get the Senate to ratify that treaty, that agreement. No, 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 he did that on his own. And so every time this comes around, uh, you have, uh, you know, the Democrats will say, well, we're not going to pay any attention to that agreement. Uh, so we're going to give money to Planned Parenthood to kill kids in poor cities because that's what's going to save the planet. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how you always have infanticide and sexual depravity go hand in hand? This is an ancient pairing. It's always been around. And you go back to the times, the biblical times, the times of the Roman Empire and so forth. But even before the Roman Empire, you could see this in the uh, land of Canaan, the Philistines and so forth. You could see it at Roman times. You could see it in Carthage. And of course, all of those cultures are part of the Phoenician culture. Uh, they were seafaring. They were traders. Uh, they were very prosperous. Uh, they you know, controlled that area of the Mediterranean. But all of them had something in common. They all worshipped 
this goddess, Ashtaroth, a fertility goddess, and they would have these wild orgies. And then a few months later, after some people had unintended pregnancies, uh, they would have a, uh, another religious festival that was centered around Moloch, the god of prosperity. And the way you become prosperous is you sacrifice your child, which is still the marketing tactics of Planned Parenthood today. Except in those days, you would actually burn your child on an altar to Moloch. And so you can go into the areas where you had ancient Carthage and you go to where the Tophet is and they just have uh, just a sea that they've discovered. The archaeologists have just found this massive collection of children's skulls. What do you think they're going to find someday in the future in America? Where are we putting all of our bodies? Where are we putting the tens of millions of kids that we destroy here in America? Are we maybe burning them more thoroughly so that we don't have any skeletons to be discovered? Well, those skeletons are still in our closet, aren't they? And we are going to have the same kind of judgment that Carthage got. Remember we had uh, Cato. Uh, one more thing. Carthage must be destroyed. And the root of this mass murder that we have here is the Supreme Court. That's why I say judicial supremacy must be destroyed. And it will be destroyed one way or the other. One way or the other. If we don't do it, God will. And you go back and you look at the Bloomberg campaign. You've actually got now Bloomberg advisor O'Brien, uh, Tim O'Brien, senior advisor of Bloomberg campaign, says Bernie has all this loopy stuff in his background, saying things like women get cancer from having too many orgasms. Or toddlers should run around naked and touch each other's genitals to insulate themselves from porn. Why has this stuff not surfaced, asked Tim O'Brien. I would think that since Tim O'Brien is a senior advisor to the Bloomberg campaign, they're about ready to sur surface this stuff. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think this is kind of the opening salvo? He's written about women's rape fantasies, but that hasn't surfaced. Yeah, there is a loony side of Bernie. Now, let me tell you something. It hasn't surfaced, and he is a darling of Hollywood because these things always go together. Historically, they've always gone together. Sexual depravity, infanticide, and an inordinate lust for wealth and prosperity, the root of all evil.